Uh, so I want to start by thanking everyone for coming today to Paris Container Day. Um, a couple weeks ago, I also had an opportunity to plan a smaller conference than this, and I know how much work goes into that. So I want to also thank the conference organizers. Can we do a round of applause for them again for planning this? All right, so I'll do a little introduction on myself first. Uh, my name is Dan Lawrence. I'm a software engineer at Google. Um, I've been working in the cloud and containers and Kubernetes space for about seven years now. Um, I started on a platform as a service project called App Engine a long time ago, and then I got involved in open source and containers and Kubernetes when I started the Minikube project back in 2016. Um, since then, I've been working on tools to make container development easier and more fun. Um, and most recently, I've been working on something called Tecton, which is part of the Continuous Delivery Foundation, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. So the agenda for today, uh, the theme for today's conference is standardization and craftsmanship. So I'm going to be talking about standardization in software, specifically software delivery. I'm going to start out by covering a brief history of standards and containers, um, and specifically Paris, the city we're in. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about standardization for software delivery. And hopefully I'm going to make a case for people uh, to believe that we should start standardizing software delivery and the CI CD field in general. Um, and then I'm going to finish with some examples and discussion about Tecton, the project I'm currently working on, which is in this area. Uh, so, I said first, I'm going to do a brief history here on standardization in containers in Paris. Um, I started researching this uh, history of standards and containers a little bit when preparing this talk, and I found out it was a little bit of a surprise to me, but Paris has a history of standardization and containers going back actually about 100 years, so a little bit longer than most people might have guessed. Um, this is Container Day, and this is the fourth edition, so I think most people here probably have a basic understanding of containers, so I'll go through that pretty quickly. Um, this is a brief history going back to about 2006 of containers. Software containers go back a lot farther than this. Um, this is kind of just a description of Linux containers, or what's most commonly known as Linux containers. Um, and around 2006, some engineers at Google released a set of patches called cgroups and namespaces for the Linux kernel. Um, this was merged in 2008, and we started to see this uh, technology be uptaken by a couple different uh, platforms, things like Warden by Cloud Foundry, LXC, uh, was a project in the Linux kernel. Uh, but it wasn't until around 2013 when Docker and a couple other uh, companies started playing with this technology. Um, Docker obviously led to the huge explosion in containers. Um, and more recently, we've started to see standardization in this field, which has led to things like the CNCF, the Open Containers Initiative, and things like Kubernetes. And uh, the huge KubeCon conference I was at a few weeks ago um, is a gathering of people building things on top of these standard pieces. Getting back to Paris, though, um, this was a surprise to me, uh, but I was looking up the history of shipping containers about all this. Um, and the very first recorded time that shipping containers were used was 1926, almost 100 years ago, and on uh, boats, luxury passenger boats that were operating between London and Paris. So instead of passengers loading their trunks and suitcases one by one onto boats, uh, this cruise ship operator decided to put them into standard sized containers that were loaded onto the boat, taken off the boat and put onto a train, and then driven here to Paris. Um, nothing really happened in this uh, for about 20 more years um, until the U.S. military started using these again in World War II. And then an entrepreneur in the U.S., um, he was a truck driver, a fleet operator, actually his name was Malcolm McLean, had an idea to speed up the loading and unloading of ships using containers like this. So he purchased a bunch from the U.S. military after the war ended um, and started operating a container company loading containers on and off of boats uh, and cutting the price to do this dramatically. This started spreading around the world. He started um, expanding internationally with shipments both to Europe and Asia, which led to, as you would imagine, a huge proliferation in the number of types of containers, how they were attached to boats, how they were loaded and unloaded. Um, so it was kind of a mess. It kind of shifted the problem from a whole bunch of small boxes and suitcases to a whole bunch of different kinds of containers. Um, and that's where the second time Paris was involved came in. Um, there was obviously a need for standardizing shipping containers. Um, and it was a surprise to me, but that took place right here in Paris as well, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, this standardization is what really led containers to kind of take over the world. Uh, people started assembling custom equipment just for, trans uh, just for transporting these containers. There were now custom shipyards built just around this concept. Uh, trains were designed for this, cranes. All these things were able to be built because of the standardization that went into shipping containers in Paris. Which brings us to today, where 90% of goods worldwide are travel in a shipping container at some point in their history, which is pretty huge. 90% like of things in this room were in a container at some point. So this is actually the standards body directions from here to the standards body in Paris, where this is maintained. 
The, inter the International Standards Organization, the ISO, delegated this to the BIC, or the International Containers Bureau. I took a walk by there yesterday once I got into Paris. But this is the organization that maintains the standards, the sizes of these physical boxes, where the fittings go, how the bill of materials is declared, all of that. Um, this other picture here is one I found while I was just walking around Lisbon last week on vacation. Um, this is a trailer for a truck. I was kind of talking about this before. This is a trailer for a truck that was designed to do one thing and one thing only, just carry standard shipping containers. You can't do this without the standard. And this is kind of the power of the standard and the ubiquitousness that shipping containers have gotten us. Um, so it's pretty exciting to be talking about standards and containers here in Paris when standards and physical containers took place just a few kilometers from here. Um, if anybody's interested more in the history on this, there's a really good book called The Box, How the Shipping Container Changed the World and Made uh, the World Economy Much Larger. Um, and so that kind of raises the question, how did a box change the world? So I think this title and kind of the argument I'm hoping to make today is that this title is a little bit of clickbait in book form. This book has kind of been older than the internet and clickbait, but it's uh, kind of along those lines. I don't mean to disparage the work of anybody that worked on shipping containers, but the box itself did not change the world. Um, what I think changed the world here is the standards. Um, when Malcolm McLean first set up his shipping company, he was able to cut prices by 30% and make a lot of money. But a lot of people make a lot of money without changing the world. To really change the world and get shipping containers everywhere that you see them today, he had to standardize this and get everyone to agree to use the same containers. And that same thing is true with software, what we're gonna talk about with the rest of today's talk. New technology and fun projects um, like this uh, can help innovate and drive uh, rapid innovation, but they can't really change the world on their own. That's where we need the help of standards organizations. Um, so why am I harping on this a little bit? It's because we're all software engineers, and standardization is the least fun thing a lot of us can imagine. Um, this is like the ultimate bike shed problem. Instead of just uh, building things and experimenting and prototyping, you're convincing everyone to agree on things. Um, inside of a company, that's really hard. So imagine this with shipping containers, where you're convincing people across the entire world to agree on the dimensions for these boxes. Um, these are trivial things on their own. The important thing is to get everyone to agree. This is not something fun uh, for most of us here, but it is really important. All right, so thanks for bearing with me through that quick history on standardization and Paris. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about standardization and software development in general. Um, I like to think of this as kind of taking the prototypes and experiments that people have built, um, the kind of things that we're building up on sand, and condensing them into concrete building blocks that we can build the next generation of things on top of. Um, so these are nothing new. Um, there are a ton of standards in software that we use every day without thinking about it. But I think that's a sign of the best standards, the things that we build on without even acknowledging them or knowing that they exist. So we've got a couple things at the top here that power the internet, um, things like the HTTP protocol, SMTP, that's how every website can interoperate, how any email client can send email to another one. <clears throat> and these are backed by real standards bodies, like the IETF, the W3C, IEEE. Uh, we even see this for things like programming languages and the C language spec. Uh, more recently, these things at the bottom are newer standards that we've been developing in the container space. Uh, so things like OCI, or the Open Containers Initiative, is a group dedicated to standardizing the container format that we use for shipping containers, just like the BIC we have here in Paris. Uh, there's a, another talk a little bit after this that gets into the details of exactly how the OCI spec describes uh, how things, uh, containers get described, unpacked, and run. So I won't get into too much there. But every time you deploy something on Kubernetes, these are the specifications that are being used. There's one other interesting type of specification here, which is Kubernetes conformance. Um, this is a specification that's actually defined by a set of tests. Um, so instead of using words like a lot of these other ones are, this is a test suite that you can point at any Kubernetes cluster, and it runs and can tell you if this is conformant. Uh, these standards are what allow the uh, proliferation of things being built on top of them. There's something like 53, I think it says 53 up there, um, distributions of Kubernetes that are all conformant. Dozens of hosted implementations and a whole bunch of different open source installers. And this standard is what allows everyone to be able to assume that something that gets running in one Kubernetes cluster can run in any of the other ones. <coughs> So um, I mentioned that we're kind of taking these uh, things we're building on sand, playing around with them for a while, and then turning them into concrete building blocks. We can't really see the explosion in the landscape here without these concrete building blocks for people to build on top of. If things are constantly changing, we can't build these things on top of them. 
Uh, this is a snapshot from the CNCF landscape. If anybody is familiar with this, it's a really cool dynamic website that lets you sort and filter all the different things in the CNCF um, space. And these are all the different things that have been built in just two of these spaces. The landscape slide by itself is enormous. Um, this is uh, things focusing on how containers are built and described. So container standardization, all these things on the left. And then continuous integration and delivery, which is the standardization piece I'm hoping to talk about next. So without a standard container format, we can't build all of these tools that can build containers in different ways <coughs> and publish them and distribute them without these standards. So all of this is because of the work in the OCI, um, which is not a very fun uh, set of work to be a part of, but it is really important. So um, a lot of people, um, especially software developers that like trying out new things, myself included, um, tend to think of like standardization as kind of a boring work, um, kind of diametrically opposed to things like prototyping and experimenting and fast iteration, which we really like to do. But I don't think they're really opposed at all. I think they're just kind of parts of this cycle, um, the cycle of innovation here. Um, on the left, when you're experimenting in a new area like this, um, we see a lot of fast progress. People are throwing things at the wall, seeing what sticks, um, prototyping. Um, nobody can really use this yet because it's uh, brand new, hasn't been battle tested. If you're familiar with the adoption curve, um, then this is kind of the early adopters that are tr trying this thing out, not worrying about if it's going to break. Um, after that, we usually see a few things take off. A few of the ideas start finding product market fit and getting rapidly used by other companies. Um, there are brand new use cases found, and we start to see an explosion like this one on the CNCF slide I covered before. Uh, people start to see that this can solve real-world business problems. And that's when the final phase of standardization or hardening comes in. This is when enterprises or large companies uh, realize the business value these things can adopt, but need firmer uh, foundations to build on and standards so things aren't constantly changing out from underneath them. Uh, with the adoption curve again, this is kind of the late majority or laggards. Um, so this is the part that seems boring to a lot of people in the industry. But the cool part here is that we get to start this cycle again. All of these things that were brand new and fancy and magical a couple years ago are now building blocks that we can just assume works in a standard way and start building the next layer on top of that. Um, all right, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about software delivery and why standardization might help here. Um, this is a slide uh, from one of my colleagues, Kay Williams at Microsoft. Um, and this describes what an ideal software supply chain looks like. Software supply chain isn't a very commonly used word, um, so I'll explain it a little bit. My background is actually in mechanical engineering. I studied a lot of manufacturing <coughs> in university. And so a supply chain in that area is how your goods get to your customers, all the way back to how you get the parts that you use, how those parts get created, um, and every link along that chain. So if you think about it like a car, you need to understand your supply chain, because if you're missing one part of that car, like a wheel or a component to the engine, you can't make any more cars and get that product to your customers. If you're doing something like pharmaceuticals, it's also really important going the other direction. If an, an issue is reported with one of the batches of drugs that you shipped um, to your customers, you need to be able to trace that all the way back to where the components came from to figure out the issue, who else might be affected, and do a recall. And the word chain is really apt here, because you really need to think of all of these steps here like links on a chain. If any one of them is broken, you lo lose the knowledge of how your products get built and how they get to your customers. And this is true for software as well. If you think about uh, your software supply chain, you start out on the left here with things like your external artifacts. These are the components you're getting from vendors. These are the packages you're getting from third-party repositories. Um, your developers are taking these, hopefully in an ideal situation, <coughs> it's going through a, an ingestion process. You have policy you want to apply as a company. Um, this can be things like licensing. You don't want to allow certain license software. Um, also, it's things like vulnerabilities. If a problem is reported in a certain uh, third-party package that you may be using, you need to have a standard ingestion process so you can see if you're using that version of the software, figure out where it's running in production, and how to mitigate that. After that, your developers start building these, combining them into artifacts that get stored. Those get built and combined into other artifacts. Um, at some point, you decide to push something to production. That becomes a stable release. And then you go ahead and do that deployment. All these steps here to the chain and software are just as important as they are um, in physical goods. Um, if you have something running in production and you find an error, if you can't trace that all the way back to the source and even the source of your dependencies, you can't figure out um, easily what bug was introduced and where in the code that was introduced. And same thing going the other way. When you get a notification about a new vulnerability or CVE, if you can't trace that all the way back from where your source code is stored to production, then you don't know if you're affected by that. You don't know what you have to rebuild. You don't know what you have to redeploy. And you can't figure out how to fix that for your users. Unfortunately, not everyone is living in the ideal world, and this is what it tends to look like at most uh, places I've, I've been and most customers I've talked to. Um, there's no standard ingestion process, or if there is, developers don't always follow it. 
the code is coming in from anywhere. People are using things like curl pipe to bash or you know, kube control run inside of a running Kubernetes cluster. Um, and you really have a hard time figuring out what's running in production. This doesn't only apply to third-party dependencies. If developers on your team are pushing things that they built on their desktop to production, then you also have issues. Um, without setting up this process and establishing every link in this chain, then you really don't have a software supply chain. And that's a problem both for security, for compliance, and production stability. So now that I've talked about standardization, hopefully made a case for why it makes sense to do this in software delivery, I'm going to talk a little bit more about a project that I've been working on called Tecton and how we're hoping to do this uh, for the industry. So you can't have a presentation without a tweet from Kelsey Hightower somewhere in it. I thought this one was the most apt for this section. Um, like Kelsey says, uh, Kubernetes is a sum of all bash scripts and best practices the system administrators and operators uh, would have cobbled together over time, except presented as a single system behind a declarative set of APIs. Kubernetes handles the runtime aspects of your supply chain. It handles the, where things get deployed um, and where they're running. So you have a standard way to declare your deployments and see what's running in those deployments. But there's a whole bunch of missing pieces in that uh, supply chain diagram still. If I jump back to that quickly. Uh, Kubernetes doesn't tell you how to handle your external artifacts. It doesn't tell you how to build your software. And it doesn't tell you how to test it. It doesn't tell you how to manage the artifacts. And it doesn't tell you how to decide what to deploy when. It just handles the actual deployment at the end. Um, so the rest of this supply chain is what I'm going to talk about standardizing next. Um, so the Tecton project is something we started about a year ago. Um, the goal is to set up uh, production-grade delivery for everyone. We want to make this easier to use and more secure by making it easy to declare these software pipelines. So we built a set of composable, declarative, reproducible um, uh, technologies on top of the standards like OCI images and the Kubernetes conforming clusters. Um, so the kind of mission here is how do we go from sand to concrete building blocks for the next generation of software delivery systems? Most people today are using cobbled together bash scripts for that, even once they have a Kubernetes cluster on the end. So how can we move up from these bash scripts to something that's reusable, safe, and secure for everyone? Um, this isn't a terribly hard problem. Um, most people could solve it with a, a whole bunch of bash given enough time, interest, and motivation to do so. Um, so this is a little overview of how we did this at Google. Um, I've been at Google for a while now. Um, and so this is a rough example of it. There's nothing magical here. Um, Google just spent a lot of time solving this problem once for all Google engineers, uh, which is pretty easy because we have a mono repo inside of Google. So all source code is stored inside of a single large repository. Um, that includes both first party source code that's written by Google engineers but also third-party source code that we get from vendors or dependency managers or package managers. That's all checked in as code to our mono repository. Um, alongside all of that, we actually store our production configurations as well. So Google uses a system internally called Borg, which was a predecessor to Kubernetes, um, and a lot of the same team that designed Borg uh, worked on the design of Kubernetes. Um, so we have declarative configuration for our deployments in source control, and we also have all of our source code. Um, from there, we can use a, basically a trusted reproducible build system. So we can take all the source code that we have and produce artifacts reproducibly. This means the same inputs always produce the same outputs. Um, alongside that, since we have declarative source-based uh, deployments um, that all go from our mono repo, uh, we can trigger deployments in a declarative safe way. Um, changes to our production environments are handled the same way changes happen in our source code. That means they go through the same review process, they go th through the same vetting, um, changes are logged, justifications are written the same exact way. Um, so from this, we get artifacts that are built and pushed to our artifact storage system, and we get uh, deployments to our production environments. Um, the cool part here is that all this logs everything to a standard metadata bus inside of Google. So things stored in this metadata bus are you know, everything all, all the way back from source changes. So who reviewed this change? What were the review comments? Were they addressed? Who authored it and why? Um, to the builds, so we can see exactly what inputs were built into which output when. Um, you can even see which versions of the compilers, which versions of all the tool chains were used. Um, if you have to patch your compiler because of an issue, you need to see everything that was built with that compiler, where it's running in production, and get that built and patched quickly. Um, and these, uh, these uh, pieces of metadata that are all stored on this bus uh, become available um, at every step along this way, so you can apply policy to all of this using the metadata. Uh, different source code directories can declare different types of policies uh, regarding who has to review things. Um, this is used at build time as well. People can only push to certain uh, locations in our artifact manager um, if they have certain permissions. Um, another cool part is that this is also available at runtime. So we can declare things like uh, 
artifacts that um, want to talk to this sensitive data store that has all of our PII, potentially identifiable information, had to have been built by somebody uh, with this level of uh, permissions, reviewed by two people, and the change had to have been reviewed as well with justification. So this helps a lot for compliance um, and security, and it also helps for tracing back production outages. Because of this metadata bus, we can see exactly which uh, changes went into which release, um, and you can easily see which change is running where in production across the entire um, source repository. Again, there's nothing magic here. Anybody could put something like this together. It's just storing metadata in a structured way. But why should everyone have to do this on their own? Kubernetes and containers give us a system where everyone is building artifacts, regardless of the language or operating system, into the same uh, artifact format. And Kubernetes gives us a standard way to run it. So why should everyone have to cobble together these middle pieces themselves? Um, and that's where we started in the Tecton project. The first step toward agreeing on a common way to describe all these steps in the middle is a common language. Um, I have a saying that I like to use, uh, that 99% of all disagreements are actually about terminology, people using different words to describe the same things, rather than actual disagreements themselves. Um, so we started talking to lots and lots of customers and lots and lots of software companies and getting them to explain how they're doing software delivery. So how a change gets from a developer's workstation all the way to production. The first takeaway is that everyone has a completely different process. Um, they describe this crazy Rube Goldberg machine of bash scripts and different tools cobbled together to get their code uh, from a workstation to production. But if you step back a little bit and squint, they're not actually that different at all. Everyone has the same goal. They want to get their software to production quickly and safely. Um, so we started by trying to tease apart the concepts, see what everyone was actually describing with their different words, um, and come up with a standard set of uh, concepts to represent these. Kubernetes did something similar with runtime environments. Um, Kubernetes figured out the core set of building blocks that you can use to assemble any uh, running system, things like pods, volumes, deployments, the core Kubernetes APIs. <coughs> so we took these concepts and tried to come up with a core set of APIs for software delivery, the missing pieces I talked about before. So how do we represent this language? Um, Kubernetes has a concept called CRDs, or Custom Resource Definitions. Um, they're a pretty new concept, and there's a lot of confusion, uh, but I like this slide to kind of explain how they work. Uh, Kubernetes CRD is just a definition. Um, it's not an implementation. Nothing magically happens when you create a CRD in your cluster. You're just kind of declaring a schema or an API. Um, so you could use this to declare actual nouns. Things like Kubernetes pods or deployments could be implemented as custom resource definitions. Um, to make them actually do something, you need something like a custom resource controller. Um, so once you have a definition, the controller is what actually acts on those objects and makes them uh, do things in the real world. A CRD can have no controllers or it can have multiple different controllers. You can have a whole bunch of different implementations for that API. The CRD is really like a set of standards. Um, so in Tecton, we started out with a couple different CRDs. Um, the first one here at the bottom is a task. This is the smallest unit of a software delivery pipeline. Um, if you're a task author, you think about how it works and the steps inside of it. So a task is represented as a set of steps that run in sequential order inside of a Kubernetes pod. So they're all running on the same node and they can share contents. If you're using a task, though, um, they've been designed to be declarative. So a task has typed inputs and outputs around it, and those are the only things you really need to see if you're assembling one of these. Uh, the task declares what inputs it takes with the basic type system. And with delivery, there's only a few types uh, that really matter, um, somewhere around a dozen. Things like artifacts, container images, production environments. Um, so a task might build artifacts from source code and push them to a production environment. And these are all types that you're going to represent in Tecton. Um, so once you have these tasks that can be reused, published, and shared um, that are typed with metadata, you can start to assemble them into a type-safe graph, which is what the Tecton Pipeline CRD represents. It's basically a language for describing abstract delivery processes. So the pipeline itself is just a set of tasks, and the task is just a set of definitions. Um, so the pipeline can assemble this into a graph based on inputs and outputs. Um, the pipeline is decoupled from the environment it's going to run in so that these can be shared and reused uh, across environments. Um, the pipeline just describes what to happen. Um, it doesn't describe what Git repo you want to run it against, which production environment you want to push it to, or where you want to store your images. Um, it's just a type-safe graph of these abstract tasks. Um, so they're decoupled. This means uh, you can start to use them across multiple environments. One of these definitions um, that you use uh, against your master branch to push to production using a GitOps workflow uh, can be taken and used directly inside of a pull request. Um, you can let untrusted users submit a pull request and you're running this in an environment that's not going to touch your production system without having to change it at all because they're decoupled and they're abstract. Your developers can run it on their local workstation, both to debug the delivery process and to try out their own code faster. 
Um, this is what an example one of these pipelines might look like. Um, this starts out with linting, running unit tests before code gets merged. After that, a pipeline can have a couple different steps that run in parallel, something like setting up a test environment, building images, and running integration tests locally. Once the test environment is set up and you have images, um, you can run end-to-end -end tests, publish your images, and deploy. And all of these dependencies are declared uh, by the graph because the dependencies are explicit. Um, you don't have to set up this parallelization yourself. Um, so uh, Tecton is a project that we started at Google, uh, but we can't set up uh, standards across the industry on our own. So we're working with a whole bunch of awesome partners, um, Cloudbees working with them on Jenkins, uh, people at Red Hat working on OpenShift, IBM, and many more. We're trying to make this project as new contributor friendly as possible. So if you're interested in helping out um, and standardize software delivery, you can find us at github.com slash Tecton CD. Um, this is part of the new continuous delivery foundation. Um, this is a neutral home for the next generation of continuous delivery. Um, continuous delivery is a practice that applies to all software development. Um, it doesn't matter whether you're shipping things to a cloud-native Kubernetes environment, Internet of Things, a mobile app, or an, an old uh, kind of HTTP system running on a serverless platform. Uh, the practices of getting your code quickly and safely to production um, matter for everyone. And so we're trying to solve this across the entire industry. All right, so in conclusion, um, Paris has a long and fun history for containers going back much farther than software itself. Um, technology is fun and important, I hope everyone takes this away, uh, but standards are necessary if you actually want to solve things across the industry or change the world. Uh, software security has never been as important as it is today. It doesn't matter if you're building a software that operates in medical devices, um, in rocket ships, or something storing your user's data. If you leak that because of a software vulnerability, it really affects people's lives, and we need to treat this seriously as an industry. And then finally, um, we're trying to solve this uh, problem and make software easier to deliver, build, and ship safely and quickly um, inside of the Continuous Delivery Foundation and in the Tecton project. So um, here are some links I'll leave people with if you're interested in learning any more about these projects. And I wanted to thank you all again for coming, and good luck to the rest of the speakers today. <laughs>